Welcome to the Tech Table, where today we're going to talk about the spring release for Premiere Pro version 13.1. I'm really excited to talk about this and demo it for you, but before we do, there's a number of improvements I just want to call out. We've been working around hardware performance improvements around H.265 HEVC for Mac and Windows users in both 8 and 10 bit. We also have new hardware decode improvements for H.264. For those of you on Macintosh using red cameras, we've got brand new metal support for you as well. Sony users asking about the Venice V3 codec, we've added that as well. Now last release for Premiere Pro, we added Apple ProRes support for Windows users. This is an amazing way to have cross-platform workflows between Mac and Windows. We're also adding external GPU support for Mac and Windows, which is really an enhancement to our multi-GPU technology that we've had for a while. A couple of things to mention around this. Windows users can use both NVIDIA cards and AMD cards, while Mac users for right now are limited to just AMD cards. And I also just want to call out that Windows users were recommending version 1803 or higher for Windows 10, and Mac users we currently only support 1014 and higher. So let's jump into the tech table and check it out. This is actually one of my most favorite features of this release. It's something I've been waiting on for a really long time, and I've been working with engineering to get this particular feature done, and it's going to save me a ton of time. And it's a new enhancement to render and replace. So let me sort of set this up for you. So we've got this clip here. Things look okay, but it's time to start putting some effects on it. So I'll just quickly just apply a LUT to this, Let's go over to my effects and let's go ahead and apply a flip to this because he's actually going the wrong direction. Now he's flying in the right direction and I'll put a little bit of a blur on there just to make it look a little more realistic for what I'm looking for. And then let's go ahead and just play that back. That looks pretty good. It's dropping a couple of frames there when it's playing back. so. How do we fix that? We can right mouse click and do render and replace. And there's a new button that allows us to include video effects. So this is gonna, in fact, do a video mix down. So I'm gonna click okay and let this render. I think you'll use this feature a lot when you just have those effects or stacks of effects that are preventing you from playing in real time. I'm gonna go down on the timeline and show you what it's done. I'm going to zoom in and you'll notice there's a new clip on the timeline that now has the same name plus the word rendered. You'll also notice when I go up in the effects area, all of my effects are grayed out with the parentheses rendered. So this is telling me that you've got effects on here, but they've been rendered. Now what happens if you're looking at this clip and you've discovered, well, my color that's on here isn't right. Maybe it's a little too yellow or oversaturated, but that's now baked in or mixed in. What you can do is you can right mouse click and you can restore it unrendered. But before I do that, I want to right mouse click and show you where the asset is in the project panel. You can see it's right here. And when I right mouse click and restore it unrendered, you'll see it's changed it here on the timeline. It's removed it from the bin and it's reactivated all those effects so I can then figure out what it is that I want to do before I mix it down again. Another great place to use this new render and replace enhancement is when you're using the warp stabilizer. Here's a shot of a behind the scenes of shooting this jetpack video where the camera's shaking around and again, very typical warp stabilizer shot. I've already applied the warp stabilizer, so I'm just gonna turn it back on. That looks pretty good. And I'm gonna render and replace that. Now, the reason this is a really good idea to render and replace this is because when you have warp stabilizer shots and maybe you're on shared storage, all of the warp stabilizer data is actually held local to the machine not to the project. So this becomes a pain because you have to reanalyze all that footage 
before it can be used in a project that someone else has opened. So again, this is gonna be a great place to use this because now I've got this effect rendered, it looks great. I can pass this project onto someone else. The warp stabilizer is in fact mixed in and I'm good to go. And as I said, I'm really excited about this feature. One of my most favorite from 13.1 release. We've added a few enhancements to the Essential Graphics panel. And let me just start out by typing some quick text on the screen. What you'll see is we now have the ability to add additional strokes. So I'll just click on additional stroke. Let me come in and just grab a color picker and I'll grab this dark blue and I'll just make this a little bit larger. And I'll add another stroke around that and make this one a little larger. You can really start to have some fun with this. You can even add backgrounds now without having to add a separate layer change opacity, change sizes, and so forth. They've even given you a lot of shadow add-ons where you can change the direction of the sun, opacity, and things like that. But where it really gets interesting is when you start playing around with mask, where you can max out the text and have things working behind the mask. It's really cool. I've got a great example of this I'll show you. With this motion graphic template, I actually have a bunch of different things set up. So let me show you what's going on here. I've got a folder called mask. I've got some text here. I've got a stroke. I created a folder called background, which has this shape layer. So if I just turn a couple of these off and on, you can kind of see what's going on. Not really a whole lot here, but where again it gets interesting is when we start turning on some of the mask options. I'll start by clicking my text and then down at the bottom, I'm going to click on a switch that says mask with text. And then I'm going to click on invert, which will actually punch a hole in that background. And you'll see as I scrub through here, I've got my main character flying through the text. It's a lot of fun. You can also have fun by animating this whole motion graphics template just by going to the vector motion area and setting a few keyframes for position and scale. I hope you'll find these new additions to the Essential Graphics panel really useful and enjoy using them. Another feature that a lot of our users have asked us for over the years is a better way to organize their media and kind of a story view. And we think we've accomplished that with the brand new freeform view. So let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna go down here in my project bin. I'm gonna hit the tilde key to take this up full screen. And as you know, we have an icon view, but a brand new view that we have, the freeform view, now allows you to organize these in a story or what I like to call stacks. You'll notice that when I click on the freeform view, it's gonna take me in the view where I was last when I was working in freeform. And as you see, I've already got some stacks arranged, some label colors assigned. I've got these large icons here. You can change the size of any of these shots, which you might call a hero shot, if you just right mouse click and then just go down to where you see clip size and you can choose whatever size you want to help represent that particular story or point. Again, it's just another tool that helps you stay organized. So that story all goes together. I can now highlight all this if I want to, right mouse click, go down to label and assign it a new color. And now I know that all of these clips go together. In addition to simple things like the size of the icon and dragging them around freely on screen and label colors, there's also a lot of other things that engineering's put in here. You can also go up to the bin and click on freeform view options, and you can actually get in there and select other metadata that you might want to appear. So they give you two lines, what I like to know the video duration. And as you see here, the clips now show me duration. Some other great things to point out is you can take any clip and set an endpoint by hitting I and an out point by hitting O, and you can start to arrange these clips in the lengths that you need, so you can really start to do some editing. You can also arrange clips in a line like here, and then drag those into a new sequence, or you could take these clips and drag them down to a bin down here, and then start organizing them into bins. 
Another useful feature is the ability to manage presets. You can save them and restore them as needed. Remember, everything you do is at a per bin level, which means each bin can have its own sets of presets. You can also manage those presets and figure out which ones you need and which ones you want to discard. Again, this is going to be a great feature that I know a lot of users are really going to appreciate. This next feature I'm going to show you came from our user voice area, which is an area you can go to to provide feedback and actually vote on features that make it to Premiere Pro. You can find the user voice area under provide feedback. And as you can see here, there was a lot of votes for add rulers and draggable guides in the program windows. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you. There's a couple of ways to get to this. You can add it to your menu, so you can add this new Show Rulers and Show Guides button to your menu underneath your program monitor, or you can get to it under the view Show Rulers and Show Guides. So I'll just go ahead and hit it here, and I'll hit the button down here for Show Guides. Now what this is going to allow you to do now, just like Photoshop, be able to drag whatever you'd like to drag out and start lining things up. Now, not only that, you can also save these as presets in case you've got other ones that you need to work on. And as you would expect, you can go and clear the guides if you need to, lock them, add more guides. So I'll go ahead and clear these and use one that I've actually created as a preset. So you see I've got a slate guide here that I created earlier that I can just call back. You can also click on any of the guides, edit that guide, Another one of those user voice features that's going to save a lot of time. And thanks to all that voted on that. Great to see it in this version. And finally, I'll give a quick demo of our new support for external GPU or eGPUs. This is supported on both Mac and Windows. Windows users can use NVIDIA or AMD. Mac users in the new OS currently only support AMD cards. I'm going to use the Mac OS 1014 because it has a really nice utility for monitoring GPU usage. Let's start by showing you how the project is put together. As I scrub through here, you can see there's a key being applied, there's a blur, a few other things happening to these layers in terms of effects. And if I go over here to the effects controls area and I start to click around, you can see there's some lumetry, as I said, some blurs and other things going on here. So there's a lot of things here to tax the GPU. Let's bring up the activity monitor and take a look at what's going on with the GPU. You'll see that the macOS activity monitor has detected that I have two GPUs in this MacBook Pro, an integrated Intel 630 and an AMD Radeon Pro 560. You'll also notice when I get down on the timeline and I start to scrub this, you'll see that the AMD 560 is hitting at 100% because I'm putting a fairly heavy load on this. And again, it's exactly what I would want to see. Next, let's go ahead and do an export and take a look at the activity monitor and export times to see how well this performs. I'll go ahead and speed this up so we don't have to wait. Total render time was about 3 minutes and 13 seconds. So next I'm going to quit out of Premiere Pro and attach the external GPU via Thunderbolt 3. You can see that the macOS activity monitor has now detected three GPUs by adding the AMD Radeon WX9100, which is what's inside of the external GPU chassis. Let's go and start another export and see what those times look like. Total render time with the external GPU was 1 minute and 13 seconds versus 3 minutes and 13 seconds without. Better than 2.5 times faster. This is great news. you got to remember, I'm on a 2-year-old MacBook Pro with an external GPU, which means I do have some room for upgradability on some of these older machines, and I can add a lot more functionality by adding an external GPU to help out my export times. There is one thing I want to point out, and that is it does make a difference what you export out to. So I'm going to switch my export to H.264, and you might be surprised to see the difference. 
You'll notice on the left hand side we have ProRes 4K exporting to ProRes 4K. And on the right side you'll notice we have ProRes 4K exporting to H.264 4K our YouTube preset. You'll also notice it's substantially faster on the right hand side with those two AMD GPUs. That's because it really makes a difference what codecs and effects you have on the timeline and also what your exporting format is, in this case, H.264. You'll also notice that we were really pushing those GPUs at 100% on the right-hand side of the screen, where ProRes to ProRes, we were only pushing the AMD 9100 at about 70%. But still, the overall time and speed gains are amazing. So 2.6 times faster with ProRes to ProRes and 4.6 four times faster with ProRes to H.264. This is just the beginning of the performance enhancements that our engineering team is starting to put into Premiere Pro. So hang tight, there's more to come.